Today we talk about the coronavirus. I'm Dr. Mark Amos, and this is Taco About Fertility Tuesday. Well, times are definitely different today. Unless you've been living under a rock, you are quite aware of the coronavirus. Now, I'm going to touch on the coronavirus a little bit, but really this discussion about how is it going to affect your fertility? How is it going to affect pregnancy? So what do we know about this virus? We know the virus is more communicable, meaning it can be passed along to people more common than things like the flu. We also know there's a wide spectrum of symptoms from very mild to people who don't know they have it, to extremely sick where people are dying at a higher rate than things like the flu. Specifically, people are really not dying from the virus. They're actually dying from the reaction their body is having to the virus. The reaction is a normal reaction. It's the body fighting the virus. But with that, swelling occurs. This swelling in the lungs can make oxygen transport across the membranes of the lungs more difficult. This then leads to difficult breathing, and is why you hear about some people being on ventilators. But even a ventilator cannot force the air across those mucous membranes in the lungs if there's too much swelling. What people are dying from is called acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is where the lungs fill up with so much fluid not just pneumonia, but the entire lung filling up with fluid that even the ventilator can no longer support breathing. Now, it doesn't mean this virus doesn't affect other organs. It may, but the lungs are the ones being affected the most and is the area causing the most damage and harm to people. About 80% of people infected with the coronavirus will have relatively mild symptoms. And about 20% of people are going to get seriously ill. And a portion of them will even need to go on ventilators. And approximately 1% to 2% of people could even die from the virus. Now, at first glance, when you look at those numbers, 1% doesn't seem high. But the issue is, is that 1% is when giving medical treatment to treat the coronavirus. The concern that we have is as the number of people go up, that 1% will become higher, not because more people will die from coronavirus, but because we won't have enough treatment to treat the people who have coronavirus. And so people will die because they don't get the treatment they need. And then that number can go much, much higher. So when you think of it, there are really two things that we need to be worried about. The first thing we need to be worried about is catching the coronavirus because we can, in general, get sick on our own and we can die due to a reaction that we have from the virus that can make it for us unable to breathe. There is a second risk, which is the risk that would occur if too many people get sick at the same time, then hospitals and doctors will not be able to keep up with the pandemic and people will have to unfortunately die because there is no amount of doctors, ventilators, and beds to treat everyone. So why am I talking about this? Because this is why many of the fertility clinics you know are closed down. They are closed for your safety, for their safety, and they are closed in general for the American public because if we get too many people sick, then people are going to die, not because of the virus, but because of the inability for the doctors to be able to handle that many patients at the same time. And this creates a very difficult situation because, as you know, the CDC, the American College of OBGYNs, has not come out and told people not to get pregnant. That means everybody on earth can try to get pregnant. 
But if you have infertility, you can't. Now, before we go into what effect that's having on you, let's talk a little bit about then, what about coronavirus infertility? Has there been any studies yet showing it affects fertility? There was a study in the beginning that found that it may affect men. That study was actually removed because it was erroneous. This highlights a critical point. The fact that we know very little about how the virus affects fertility. And the fact that even the things we know, we find out later, we're wrong. So the information out there is all over the place. At this time, although the research is still ongoing, there have not been any studies done to see if contracting the COVID-19 infection will make it harder to get pregnant now or later. So the takeaway here is that we don't think it affects fertility, but we also don't have all information yet to really know. When compared to other outbreaks by viruses similar to the coronavirus, such as SARS, we have not seen fertility issues. So we believe that will be similar in this situation. So what about pregnancy? How does it affect pregnant women? Will it make them sicker? Do they have higher risk? Will it affect the baby? Well, according to the World Health Organization, pregnant women don't appear to be at greater risk for illness related to COVID-19. And only 1% of pregnant women infected experienced severe illness that required medical attention. Whereas the CDC does have information on adverse pregnancy outcomes in pregnant women with COVID-19. But most of their data is coming from prior related coronaviruses such as SARS and MERS during pregnancy. The actual evidence right now in pregnancy is that it isn't transmitted to the baby. But again, the information is still coming in. We do not know 100%. What we do know is women in general, when they are pregnant, are at higher risk of getting infections because they're immunocompromised. Their bodies are supposed to not fight infections as much because you're pregnant. And that can lead to getting infections more. Now, what we know about that is that when there are fevers in pregnancy, it has been linked to neural tube defects. Those are defects with such as spina bifida. So the takeaway here is, although we don't know if the virus can be transmitted to the baby, and we don't believe it can, we don't know for sure. And we do know that women are at higher risk of getting infections when pregnant, so they might be at higher risk of getting COVID-19. And if they get symptoms, they could get fevers, and those fevers could lead some, to some issues. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have some evidence. So in Wuhan, China, nine pregnant rem- women were infected with COVID-19, and all of them recovered from their illness, and all of them had live births without any evidence of transmitting the virus to the baby. The virus was not detected in the cord blood. The virus was not detected in the amniotic fluid or in throat swabs from the newborn or from the mom's milk. However, recently, there were three infants born to women with the virus in China. And the question is, did the virus occur of transmission during the delivery? Or did it occur in utero? This recent news now sparks the question, is this possible to transmit to the baby in utero? And the answer is, it's possible. We just don't know yet. So clearly, there are risks. Most of these risks are unknown. But there are risks to pregnancies. There are risks to the infants. And there's a risk to America as whole, or even in other countries, if too many people get sick at the same time. The same thing goes with pregnant women. Pregnant women are a very subspecial group. When you treat a pregnant woman, it's not like you can just go to any doctor. As most of you women know, most doctors get afraid whenever they have to deal with anything involved with a female. 
So when you're pregnant, if you have a serious illness like COVID-19, you can't just go to the family doctor. You have to go to specialists who are experts in the female reproductive system and how their body reacts in an infection when pregnant. And there are very, very limited number of doctors in this field. We call this maternal fetal medicine. Now, it doesn't mean OBGYNs can't help, but most OBGYNs do not work with ventilators. And most ICU doctors are not working with pregnant women. And so if even 1% or 2% of all pregnant women got put on ventilators, this would be a great burden to the medical system because there just is not enough doctors. And potentially, death could occur again, not because of the fact of just the virus, but because of the fact there's not enough options to treat everyone. Because of this, on March 17, 2020, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine released clinical recommendations to the public and to doctor offices who provide fertility medication. These recommendations were based on the public health concepts of containment, mitigation, and resource optimization, and that they would apply to all reproductive medicine practices regardless of the setting and take into consideration the health of patients, providers, physicians, clinical staff, and the population as a whole. The first recommendation was to not initiate any new treatment cycles. This includes ovulation induction, IUIs, IVF, and any non-urgent egg or embryo freezing. The second recommendation was to strongly consider canceling all embryo transfers, whether they are fresh or frozen. The third recommendation was to continue caring for people who are in cycle or who have urgent needs for stimulation or cryopreservation. That's both egg or embryo freezing. Number four, to postpone elective surgeries and any non-urgent diagnostic procedures. And number five, to prioritize telehealth over in-person contact. They went on to further define diminished ovarian reserve and said while age and diminished ovarian reserve are time sensitive, at present, these should not be included in the definition of urgent care. Not surprising to say, this recommendation was not taken easily by everyone. On one side of the table, you had doctors like myself and others who felt this was overreaching, who felt that fertility is not something elective, it is something like any other medical problem, a disease. On the other side of the table, there were doctors who I will quote, put assisted reproductive technology is considered an elected procedure. And it is expected that the response to COVID 19 will redirect healthcare resources towards urgent and emergent endeavors. So, who's right? Who's wrong? The answer is neither are wrong. Both group of doctors are looking out for the best care of their patient. We all want the same goal. It's just each of us are looking at the risk different. The doctors who support closing everything, it's not that they don't think fertility is important, but that the risk of staying open may pull resources from the other doctors who are trying to treat the COVID-19 pandemic. The group on the side who wants to stay open feels like the risk to COVID-19 is small because maybe their area hasn't had the virus yet or has very minimal of it and feels like why should patients not be able to get pregnant just because they have a medical problem. When this first came out, I was the ones upset. I was the ones who felt this isn't fair to patients, but I was also fortunate enough to be in the state that did not have a large outbreak of COVID-19. Whereas in New York, I don't even think this is debatable. But 
With the continued progression of this virus, we see that everyone is going to get infected. With the questionable evidence now coming out that it may affect pregnant women, maybe even babies, my opinion has changed some. I still am in the camp of wanting to proceed with fertility treatment, but I also now recognize that this is a bit of a danger and that their intentions were wholehearted and altruistic. So how do we as doctors overcome this dilemma when we know there is risk, but we also know there's risk of not providing treatment to our patients? I wish I had the answers. Now, I think if we could provide care without taking risk ourselves, without risking other patients, then this would be a very easy decision. The question is, how do we do that? Do we give every patient masks? Do we check your temperature at the, at the front door? How do we prevent people from getting this virus? How do we prevent it from getting worse? I wish we had the answer. To make it even more difficult, many states have passed laws that prevent elective procedures from occurring. And non-urgent procedures from occurring. And there's no question, although IVF may not be elective, it is not an urgent procedure. So then, do we look to doctors to break the law to be able to provide treatment? As you can see, this is a very difficult situation for physicians. Our number one thing is to do no harm. But we also want to help. That's why we went into this field. The reason some of these doctors are risking their lives on the front line is because we all worked hard to get to this point. This is what we wanted to do. So now fertility doctors are in this position where do we not treat our patients to protect other people and to protect our coworkers on the front line? As a doctor, the ethical dilemma is enormous. As a patient, it creates some uncertainty that you already had and made worse. Everyone who has infertility never thought they would have infertility. No one ever woke up one day and said, you know, when we have a kid, let's get another man or woman involved. No one wants to see a fertility doctor. Again, it's something you have no control over. You're doing it because you have to. Well, now you're put in another position. Now you can't do something because someone else won't do it for you because another group is not letting them. And so now as a fertility doctor, I can't even give you a timeline of when things are going to be okay because nobody knows. And in all honesty, really nobody knows. Our president just changed the date of the stay at home recommendations to add a whole nother month. This shows how little we know about this virus and how it's changing day by day. I can't imagine how hard this has to be for fertility patients right now to be in this holding pattern, not knowing when you're going to be able to seek the help you need. And yet something so important to you is considered non-urgent, considered elected by some. I can't begin to understand the frustration. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Pat Flynn here, host of the award-winning podcast, The Smart Passive Income Podcast, which was created to help you learn how to become an entrepreneur. And in the simplest way, too, you know, entrepreneurship can be very difficult. I like to simplify things. And I interview people like Josh Hall and Shane and Jocelyn Sams and Maria Fela. Who are they? Well, they're people just like you, people who have taken action after listening to the show and have built a business that has changed their lives. And I'd love to share an episode with you that I think will inspire you to get started, too. Check out the link in the description or go to smartpassiveincome.com slash 122 to get inspired, get what you need to get started, and change your life. You got this, and thank you. Yes, I've been through fertility, but when I needed it, 
I was able to get it. For some of you, this is much, much more difficult because you have severe diminished ovarian reserve. You've been told by your doctor, if you don't do something now, you may not be able to have kids. And now you're told you have to wait. You're told by the society that even if you have this severe diminished ovarian reserve, it's still not considered urgent. I wish I could give you an answer of when this is going to be over, when you're going to be able to start fertility treatments again. Right now, our clinic, we are preparing to proceed, but are listening to our government and to our association of what is the right thing to do. We are brainstorming ways to keep everyone safe, not just at our clinic, not just our patients, but everybody. We feel if we can come to a decision that will be safe, then we're going to keep continuing. If we feel there is no way for us to be safe, or if for legal reasons we can no longer be open, then we will completely close down as well. So what can you do in the meantime? Well, I think most of us believe that within three months, all fertility clinics will be open. Now, I may not be right about that, but that's what we believe. And there are things that you can do to improve egg quality. There are things you can do to improve sperm quality. And interesting enough, egg quality and sperm quality, the things you do for them, take about three months to benefit you. And so right now, for the people who have the time to do this, it might be a good time to start these things. So for egg quality, you can do things like starting CoQ10. We usually recommend about 600 milligrams of that a day. You can take DHEA, 75 milligrams a day. That's going to help with some egg quality. Make adjustments in your lifestyle. Low inflammatory diets, reducing inflammation, such as low carbs, can help improve egg quality. So since you can't do treatments right now, what a great time to start doing that since you have nothing else to do. On the same token, for men, they can do things such as getting on vitamins that can help improve sperm quality, staying away from heat sources, such as hot tubs or baths, or putting a laptop on their lap. It's not ideal. I know you'd rather be doing treatment, but if you can't do treatment, at least let's start doing the things that can help improve your chances when you are ready. If you're a patient who doesn't get normal cycles, such as people with PCOS, maybe your doctor might be okay giving you Clomid or Femara, and you can just keep trying at home even though you can't do things like IUIs. Now keep in mind, we still do not know the risk to pregnancy and to babies completely. So you're going off of very limited information, but again, it overall seems it should be okay, and possibly with Sign consent, they may allow that. Men who have lower sperm volumes, but not severely low, might be able to be put on medications like Clomid from a urologist and can bump your numbers up where maybe you may be able to get pregnant at home without even needing an IUI. The hardest group is going to be the group that already has severe dementia ovarian reserve. Women who are at 42 on the cusp of fertility. I would highly recommend doing the things we just talked about to help improve egg quality. I think the good thing is, is that three months should not be the difference of you getting pregnant or not getting pregnant. It may make it harder. It may even require another cycle of treatment. But it shouldn't prevent you from getting pregnant completely. Yes, there are doctors out there who say you need to get started right away. But honestly, I've never told a patient one month it's going to be the difference, unless you're like 45, and then that is true. But if you're around 42, even with diminished ovarian reserve, a few months is not going to be the difference of getting pregnant or not. I think it's also important for us to think about other people who cannot get pregnant right now, such as our LGBTQIA community who require things like donor sperm or a surrogate to be able to have a kid. 
who may be undergoing some type of transition and may need to freeze gametes. There's also many women who want to get pregnant on their own and need to use donor sperm and cannot get pregnant now. And if they are near the end of reproductive life, they may miss their opportunity completely. I'm not going to talk about how to limit your risk of exposure to COVID-19 or how to prevent getting COVID-19. There are many resources out there for you, such as the CDC website. But what I do want to say is that I'm sorry. I know this is a very difficult time for everyone, and I wanted you to understand that this is also a very difficult time for reproductive doctors. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversation with my friends who are other doctors about how frustrated we are, how we want to do the right thing, but we know the right thing is also the wrong thing in one situation, and the wrong thing is the right thing in another. This is not easy. And so I ask that everyone just understand that we really do want what is best for you. We want to prevent our employees from getting sick. We want to prevent people from dying from too many people getting sick and not being enough respirators. In the end, whatever the decision your clinic takes, they're trying to do the best and balance that ethical dilemma. And the support we get from you, even though you still are disappointed, we greatly appreciate. And we want you to understand that as soon as we can start, we will. And when we do start, there's going to be a backlog. And we appreciate people understanding that we're going to do our best to get everyone through as fast as possible. In the meantime, take this time to help improve your egg quality, your sperm quality. If you're thinking about using donor sperm, maybe start looking at those donors. If you're thinking about using a surrogate, start looking into that process. If you're planning on doing IVF to prevent a disease, maybe start on working on the probe now. Anything you can do in this meantime when we can't do treatment, take advantage of that time to get those things done. When it comes to the clinics that are still running partly, please do not go to the clinic if you have any symptoms of being ill. I know how bad you want to be pregnant, but it's never worth risking the lives of the people that are helping you. And most of all, please be safe. I don't know how I could sleep at night if I knew I infected a patient and they succumbed to this disease because we stayed open. I wish everyone a safe week. Please stay home if you have the possibility of doing it. And don't forget, even three months should not be the reason you can't get pregnant. I look forward to talking to you all again next week. And as always, appreciate all the reviews and recommendations. If you have questions, please send them to tbft at newdirectionfertility.com. That's tbft like in Taco Bell Fertility Tuesday at newdirectionfertility.com. I love you all. and We'll talk to you next week on... Talk about Fertility Tuesday.